Welcome everyone to the Authentication Paradox uh, series uh, from Secure Auth, uh, which we are just starting uh, and we'll be covering various topics around authentication uh, and what's going on in the trends and, and, and market. So today's topic is focused on cyber insurance, exciting topic. And we have a very special guest, our brilliant uh, Director of Solution Engineering, Donovan Blaylock. Welcome Donovan. Thanks everybody. So Donovan, let's start, you know, cyber insurance is an interesting topic, it's hot. So, so why is it becoming so hot and what's going on with cyber insurance that, that everyone is talking about it now? Sure, it started a few years ago where companies made a financial or a risk-based decision to hedge their concerns about being breached, either from a public image perspective or from a financial loss perspective by purchasing cybersecurity insurance which is a new kind of insurance that's come out and become very prevalent across the enterprise. Uh, and it's grown since, right? Now it's extremely prevalent. I would say most organizations either have it or look to look at it every single year as a potential purchase. Yeah, no, it's very interesting. And so what are the cyber related requirements for cyber insurance now? Uh, because it's since it's becoming more so relevant now, uh, I'm sure the cyber insurance companies have very specific requirements around it. Yeah, it has every year become a little bit more specific. There are, are essentially 12 sections of requirements inside the cybersecurity policies. A lot of it goes to how well you have deployed your cybersecurity uh, capability sets across the enterprise to thwart attacks. Uh, obviously, they don't want to insure somebody who's wide open and not performing best practices out there. But, but those things have changed significantly over the past three or four years as they have learned more and more about uh, the different cybersecurity insurance requirements. Right. And I know that, you know, obviously traditional MFAs have been around forever, right? So, uh, and cyber insurance companies were requiring traditional MFAs before. How is that working out? Has that been working out? Yeah, authentication, multi-factor authentication really hits four of those 12 different requirements out there. And historically speaking, they simply asked, were you multi-factor authenticated? And people click the checkbox. Um, and what they have found out is when somebody says yes, they didn't necessarily check. They didn't validate. They didn't send you information to back it up. It wasn't fully deployed, i.e. 90% or more for all authentications. That was not accomplished either. Um, and the type of MFA you're doing is, was likely outdated. So um, those are things they become a lot smarter on. So it's no longer a checkbox going forward because insurance companies are not in the business of paying out, right? If they've had to pay out for companies that are not doing these things appropriately, they've learned their lesson and have changed their tactics. No, absolutely. And cyber insurance companies have to protect themselves as well, right? Uh, really? Because yeah. so many just going on. Uh, so what are they doing? And what are the cyber insurance companies doing if you're just using traditional MFA? Yeah, so what we're seeing in the policies coming out at least this past year is proof that you have deployed to 90% or greater inside the enterprise. And they're starting to ask questions about what type of MFA techniques you're utilizing in those four different buckets, right? So push to text, push to email, TOTP, these very easy and arguably uh, additional vector opening uh, areas of your enterprise. If those are being employed, you're either uh, being deemed a higher risk or just being dropped. Mm, yeah, that's interesting. Has there been a, ma a mandate around this? Because as you know, regulations drive buying behavior in, in uh, cybersecurity and CISOs and the information security teams actually frankly get more budget if there's a regulation, right? So mandates sometimes can help. Uh, has there been a mandate around this? Yeah, so the US government has a mandate around this for not only itself, but its partners and people who work do business with it. We also have in the energy sector, banking sector, and some very large institutions in the United States have also implemented uh, the fact that these legacy MFA techniques are no longer valid forms of authentication. Yeah, that's interesting. So hopefully that'll uh, drive some of the decisions as well. So what would you recommend uh, from your perspective the companies should do uh, going forward? Yeah, in order to obtain cybersecurity insurance and get the best rate possible from an authentication perspective, and frankly, shore up your enterprise for, for what's to come in next generation, you need to get fully deployed MFA, 90% or greater across the board and use techniques that are not easily hackable. Um, so if you're using push to text, push to email, TOTP, even push to app, you should start looking at techniques that are stronger in the future, not only for cybersecurity insurance, but also for your own um, good, goodwill and, and capabilities. Yeah, no, that's great advice. So I think that's all the time we have today. Uh, Donovan, thank you very much for sharing your insights. I'm sure uh, audience will gain a lot from that. Thank you very much for joining. Thank you.
And thank you all for joining as well. Um, just quickly about Secure Auth, you know, we're focused on passwordless continuous authentication with invisible MFA, also called phishing resistant MFA, uh, with risk engine, which is AI ML driven. There's a ton of stuff on our site for cyber insurance. Uh, it's under the solutions section. There's an ebook, there's a webinar. If you want to learn more, uh, please go check it out. And please subscribe to our Secure Auth uh, YouTube channel because we'll be doing more of these episodes uh, with the authentication paradox. So see you next time. Thank you very much.